I'm Billy Chen, and I'm president of the Architectural League, and I'm really happy to welcome you all here today to um, Emerging Voices. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Architects newspaper, because there's a wonderful article about our Emerging Voices, um, and especially to thank Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown, who are here tonight, because they are sponsoring this event. I also want to thank Sunil Ball, Henry Cobb, Mario Gooden, Car Carrie Jacobs, Anna Katz, and Tom Pfeiffer, uh, who were all on the jury. So um, I think we're starting first with Silo, right? Yes. OK. Um, so and actually, I don't know. It says Silo A-R-N-D. Is that how you say it? A-R-N-D? Or R-P-S-T? R-N-D, kind of how a pirate would say it. Ardy, Ardy. Um, Frank Jacobus and Mark Minack. Um, previously an Ohio and Arkansas practice, and I think now more, late, more based in Arkansas. So there used to be a show on NPR called The Car Guys, Click and Clack, the Tappet Brothers. And it was two guys who went to MIT and told you how to fix your car. So most people who listened to it didn't have a car, but there was a combination of an advice and a kind of weird wit that was very interesting. So Frank and Mark remind me of Click and Clack. Um, their work comes from a sensibility that blends practicality with a slightly maniacal and skewed view of the world. It both works and is funny. You will see this in the mood ring house and the precise and often um, scathing and hysterical analysis in the um, archographic book. So um, tonight we have Silo. Well, welcome everybody, uh, and thank you, Billy, for that wonderful introduction. I'm Click, um, and we're so happy to be here. Um, I want to start with thank yous, uh, first of all, to the Architectural League, to Ann, to Matt, and, and all the hard work that you all have done to Billy and the, and the great jury this year. Um, Billy's an inspiration. Um, to Marlon Blackwell, thank you very much. Marlon couldn't be here tonight, but I know he's watching. And Marlon me has meant so much to both Mark and my career, and he's a champion, a constant champion, and we love him, and we, uh, we admire him both for his, his practice and his teaching, and he, he, uh, he, we learn from him on a daily basis. And thank you to also the Faye Jones School and Peter McKeith, whose support has, has made this possible. And to our staff, thank you, because they really do all the work. And then the final thank you, I think, is to uh, our families who also put up with us uh, when we often probably work too hard. And maybe, Callie, you can speak to this, talk too much about architecture when we're on vacation and that sort of thing. So um, Mark and I both have uh, one foot in academia and one foot in the professional world. And we think that this combination is where our practice finds its discipline, and we try to celebrate this, um, this duality. So, um, as Billy said, our practice really emerges out of um, two of the, the great design centers in the United States, um, Ohio and Arkansas, um, more specifically Cleveland and Fayetteville. Um, these are really interesting places to work because um, they're really, they, they have strong paradoxes, so they're extremely wealthy, extremely needy. Um, they're typically importers of architecture, and we'd like to change that really to an export commodity. Um, we're not really interested in being labeled regionalist architects. We find that pretty uninteresting, but we are interested in launching a global practice from these places. So um, particularly we're interested in getting work in New York, so any clients in the audience, Please, after give us, the, give us a call. The, yeah, yeah after, afterwards we'll talk. 
So we're, our practice uh, really has a sort of hybrid energy like Billy was talking about. Um, well, I would say we're two partners who embrace the new notion of the difficult whole. Mark and I aren't uh, the same in, in many respects. And uh, we, we have a similar sensibility, but we attack things in very different ways in the world. Uh, we both embrace this idea of loss of control. And having, uh, as architects, I know we typically hate that notion, but um, we want to embrace this idea that some things can be under our control, but we're going to find the beauty in the things that often can't be under our control. And we look at our practice as a series of performances and our inspirations, uh, these kind of dynamic duos that are our inspirations. One is Penn and Teller, of course. A pair who really advance a political project through uh, their exuberant personalities, through a medium, in this case, hip hop, and we love that about them. And per perhaps the most important and powerful analogy um, is professional wrestling for us. Um, this is the Heart Foundation. They're sort of unified by the costume and the, and the persona, and we find that that really interesting. It's also highly scripted initially, but if you study wrestling, professional wrestling, it's also highly improvisational. So we wanted to keep this slide up here as long as possible because we think it's the first time in the history of emerging voices that professional wrestling has shown up. So another way we look at our work and we talk about our work, and because we are partners who don't, and I'm sure a lot of partners are like this, but we don't agree on everything and often we don't agree on anything. So we, we talk about our work a lot through this idea of the equation. And we care about the history of architecture deeply and we think that uh, there are influences that we have that sometimes are explicit and sometimes not, but we try to find where those influences are coming from. It's a, a way that we're taking in contemporary culture all this uh, vast information that exists out in the world that has no quality, and just like architects have done for thousands of years, we take this chaotic information and we have to give it quality. What would it look like if we saw uh, the career of great architects as if they're running on a, on a racetrack. When did they win their first awards? When did they get married? When did they get divorced, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Very important moments in the career of every this architect. Is, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, what would it look like uh, if we mapped the travels of various architects as though they were constellations? And then finally, uh, what would it, the career look like of an architect such as Le Corbusier if we looked at it through the lens of a bird flight map? Um, so we're going to present the, the, the buildings and, and built stuff through um, three kind of chunks of, of, of modes of practice with, with different labels. Um, so the, the first group, we're going to really talk about um, the pleasure of pursuing the impossible middle in this diagram. So um, a lot of our work, we work in environments of extreme resourcefulness. A lot of our work is incredibly inexpensive and delivered very quickly. And we don't know if it's good. I mean, I guess that, I guess it is because so, we're here, but... Um, it is. Uh, you know, there's, there's, a certain, there's a certain level of, of um, understanding that process and, and, again, finding pleasure in that process, but also, um, and this is really for Marlon, because he always uses a Johnny Cash uh, image in his lectures, and so we wanted to find ours, because he's, he's an Arkansan. Um, but really, like the unexpected effects and qualities that emerge out of really pursuing work in this in this way. Um, so the our 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 practice really started with a, a project for an urban church uh, in in Cleveland. This is North Church. We call this project North Presbyterian Church. Um, they lived in a in an old historic building um, that was big, and they couldn't afford to be there. It's a congregation of primarily um, needy and, and um, you know, homeless and things like that. And they needed a new place. And so after a long search, they found the warehouse building on the right, um, right next to the great used tire dealership um, in, in this Cleveland neighborhood. Um, so the, the charge of the project was really, how do we begin to um, take the qualities of their former home the image on the right, and sort of imbue this warehouse space um, to make it feel like that, as dignified as that space made them feel. Um, 
So we looked at, um, in this project was really, really tough because it was a Presbyterian church uh, with a congregation who was primarily Baptist in a building owned by Lutherans. So it was a very, very tricky project. And uh, the part, of the pro part of the brief was that they had to share the space during the week with the Lutherans. So the Lutherans would use it as meeting space, and then it had to be converted on the weekends into um, a church. So we had a lot of users um, that occurred over a week, and we had two clients on the project and one really um, great contractor. Um, so we had the, so the project began about how do you maximize volume, symmetry, indirect light, um, but also um, modulating the surface in a way that would, would accommodate the movable partitions that we needed to subdivide the space. So we had two datums, one which was the height of the headers for the uh, partitions, the lower level, the lower datum, and then the upper datum was really the maximum volume that we could get in the existing structure. Um, so it created this kind of undulating surface um, that was sort of vacuum formed to the existing conditions. And then we began to look at uh, patterning the surface. And this patterning uh, was a triangulation that sort of reinforced the geometry of the, of the vaults and modulation. But it was a subdivision in a, in a repetitive pattern that allowed the project to be economically basically produced. So think about the, the least expensive project that you've ever done and then divide by two and that's the amount of money that we had. Um, so it was, a really, it was a really challenging project. The, the colored triangles were um, sort of taken as a reference to the stained glass windows in their former home. Um, the white tiles were where the sprinkler heads go because they don't make brown sprinkler heads. And uh, it was a nice way to really introduce um, a little bit of reflectivity, natural light into the space. So another thing that was really a big challenge on this project was that it was uh, the contractor guaranteed the maximum price before we were done with the design. So any of you that have ever designed something that way, it's a big challenge. So we put instructions into the documents that would allow the contractor, if there was a different condition or something like that, to effectively improvise um, and make their own triangles on the fly, because we couldn't stop. So we used, we kind of looked to Saul Lewitt's work for inspiration in that way and, the, and basically the way that we developed the documents for the project. Um, and then this is the result. So um, the, the ceiling was actually done by a cabinet maker, which really helped out quite a bit. Um, and the triangles were, were basically a repetitive system um, that was, was actually symmetrical but non-repeating. And so the contractor called us one day with sounding really concerned and they told us they built the entire ceiling upside down and we got to tell them no problem. Um, actually, we got to get some things back in the project that we gave up. So this is actually it shows you in church mode and meeting mode and the beautiful movable partitions that we had to use. So this is the entry actually, what you're looking at over here on the, on the left hand side. So we didn't, even though it has a kind of symmetrical organization, we didn't want the the, the parishioners that come from really humble backgrounds sort of enter in at the corner behind, behind the audience. Um, <clears throat> and then it was a really economical project, so this cathedral canopy that we ended up with was really what we had in the architecture, and uh, everything else in the building became um, just sort of knocked down and painted white, so we kept as much of the existing warehouse as we could, including the fire sprinkler main um, that our ceiling uh, bent around um, which became sort of an elastic geometry that, that was pretty interesting. Um, after the project, we began to draw it and sort of think about what we did. We, we saw the, the colored tiles in this, in this project is sort of suspended in animation, and we were speculating on sort of how they might project and influence the space. And this idea of the cathedral um, actually reappeared in a subsequent project for a, a private house in Johnson, Arkansas. Um, where, where the clients were really interested um, in pursuing, uh, they asked for every room to have a cathedral ceiling, actually. Um, so the, the, it was an interesting site, mostly floodplain, but it had four distinct landscapes. So each room uh, goes and sort of orients itself in relationship to those landscapes and has really distinct character. 
So the rooms are divided, but the form became unified. So what was a kind of interior volume in the church became a way to establish an exterior volume in this project. And we call this house the split personality house because um, the splits between the rooms became these interesting moments of connection and, and distinction. So these are diagrams that really talk about those relationships in, in the different forms. Um, so the, the exterior appearance of the house really changes dramatically as you move around it, um, which is, a, again, a theme that really shows up in, in, in the projects and subsequent work. Um, but it orients itself and sort of sits on a platform to get out of the floodplain and opens up to its environment in really different ways. Um, so this looks out actually into a, a kind of forested landscape. But really the parts of the project that we, were, that we were super excited about were the relationships between the different zones and rooms um, that allowed the environment to penetrate deep into the interior. Um, and that sort of opening up um, and creating really distinct presences uh, between flat and, de and deep and different surfaces is something that we used again um, in, a, in another project, which is a, a tree house on a treeless site uh, for the Cleveland Botanical Garden. This was a competition that we won. Uh, we call this project Reflex. Um, so it was, we used the economy of the, of the house shape um, to really uh, sort of bring back the idea of the tree house. Again, this is on a really difficult treeless site. It's actually in a courtyard. Um, but also the house shape began, began to sort of work in a way to create a series of periscopes which drew the garden down into the courtyard. But really in terms of the architecture, it was also a way to create really distinct presences as you move around it from incredibly flat um, to incredibly deep. Um, this was a project that we actually built ourselves. Um, it was an architect-led design build project. It was, we did this for $10,000 in 10 weeks. Um, and so we're, it, was a, it was a really interesting project for us because it was the first time that we executed something um, this way from a distance. And uh, it was a really important project for us too for, for basically experimenting with how um, to really create distinct interior and exterior environments in a project. Um, so we were, it, was, it really became this kind of lattice for play for the, for the kids. And, um, the reflection in the environment is also, a, I would say, an architectural cliche that we've been really interested in exhausting in, in subsequent work. So, um, yeah, that's the treehouse. So another mode <clears throat> that we see ourselves working within is what we call the ordinary orgy, uh, which we would define as a nesting of multiple independent personalities coming together around a specific uh, architectural event. And so we use this notion in, in many of the projects and this idea of uh, many people acting on a particular project or problem, uh, those people maintaining their autonomy and identity, but the combination of those ideas and thoughts coming together and the combination, as we mentioned earlier, of multiple influences uh, coming together to form a project um, becomes that idea of the, uh, the orgy. Um, we had a project that we uh, were asked to do by a Baptist um, mission organization called The Hedge. And when we first met this group, they said, <clears throat> one of the things we might want you all to do is rebrand uh, our organization because they started to think the, the, the Hedge may be passe, it wasn't working for them, but it was of religious significance to, to their organization, The Hedge did mean something to them, but they thought it wasn't a modern enough brand. And immediately, I think Mark and I had the same reaction, which was, no, we don't want to rebrand. We actually want to use this idea of the hedge, the idea of the topiary, as an architectural inspiration. So we started showing them these diagrams where you have this external body that is very solid in the hedge, and that external body starts to uh, indicate some sort of strength and shelter and ideas of, of like that. And then the inside of that hedge becomes this meshed existence so that you can present a solid body on the outside and then when one moves into this organization, you can have an openness and connectivity uh, within. In addition to those ideas, we wanted to draw from uh, the surrounding environment. So we thought of the beautiful Arkansas sunsets and we wanted to basically pull those sunsets into the building 
uh, through uh, with a sectional quality through the building, and I'll show you that in just a second. So the building sits along Clinton Drive, which is just catty corner from um, Bill, Bill and Hillary Clinton's house in Fayetteville. And so the middle plan that you see there uh, shows you the administrative areas and open area uh, on the south side of the building. The upper floor, we, we were asked to design uh, residences so that uh, they can actually generate some income. The, the site also generates income from the football game. So there's a, a what we do to the, the site, surrounding site was very important because they needed to park a bunch of cars and that's actually how they make uh, a, a lot of their money, if not most of their money. And in the bottom plan there, you can see the there's a, a, um, a place where the sermons and musical events happen within the uh, project. And so the top section, you see this connection to the street. You see how the, the residential units are lifted up off of the street. And we tried to have this notion of connectivity from the street and this free flow of traffic. An idea that would help draw people in, this is becoming a very pedestrian street, and so we wanted People, uh, students uh, mainly who are walking along the street to feel like they could see what was going on inside and feel as though they would be welcome in this place. So again, we, Mark mentioned exhausting the architectural cliche, and so we thought this idea of the hedge, we felt like is becoming kind of cliche in architecture, the idea of the, the, um, the, the living wall and the living surface. And so we started to think about and talk about these ideas and said, what if this was presented like it was hair? You know, and so these different hairstyles, different hairstyles start to become the way one defines themselves as a person. They start to have particular hairstyles. And we also started to get interested in that these hairstyles can change. The, the change in those styles start to redefine you as a person. And we started to get excited about the idea of seasonal change. And we mentioned this idea of loss of control and how seasonal change in this uh, building could end up allowing us to have some semblance of control, but as the seasons change, we start to lose control over the aesthetic of the building. This rendering shows what this building would look like in the various seasons. And so you see this notion of the hedge is taken quite literally as, a, as the brand becomes the building. And you can see the porosity at the street where one could see what's going on inside, uh, understand the event that's happening within. And we like the idea of this solid and then this mesh starting to operate in a series of layers in section through the building. And you can see there the color that starts to indicate uh, or is analogous to the Arkansas sunset. And then you see it better here. So that entire section of the building opens up so that events that are going on inside, everybody can be involved in those events even if they're not directly involved in the events. This is an image of the inside. So on each floor, you get a kind of fraction of that sunset. And then when you move down and are a part of the uh, sermon or a part of the musical events that go on in the space, you can see how the sunset starts to line the inside of those walls. This building also looks back out over that sunset as it gets reflected into the walls. Another project, um, again, that we think of as an organized orgy is uh, uh, called the Phase Box. And the Phase Box was a commission uh, that was given to us by Peter McKeith and the Faye Jones School of Architecture. And they were asking for a small uh, booth that would operate as a confessional uh, about experiences at the school. And so we immediately sort of stormed in and said, we, we have limited amount of space. This is going to be built in the school. It's got to be built relatively inexpensively. And so we wanted to maximize the potential of the amount of what I would think of as depth in the flat or the amount of architecture that can happen in a very limited surface. And so we like to think of this as five architectures collapsed into three quarters of an inch. And so we took ideas, the, the, the School of Architecture uh, has a legacy of Faye Jones, uh, a, a legacy of, of Edward Drell Stone, of, of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright through Faye Jones. And so we started thinking about this as a textile block project. In this case, vacuum-formed textile blocks. And we started to uh, look at things like the Heatherwick Pavilion and this idea of the hairy surface or hairy, uh, the hairy surface in architecture that was coming out of these ideas of the hedge as well. And how do we collapse these things onto, onto the surface? So the surface you see here is the, uh, the textile block that you can see on the fourth uh, one down, we were looking at Eberswald and the idea of the graphic surface collapsed into that textile block. And then finally, the greatest architectural detail in history, the, the zip tie that holds everything together and the voided corners, which was paying homage to Faye Jones and the voided connections that he would make. 
So the, it became a fairly simple after that because it was a frame that these textile block pieces get wrapped around. And it, we wanted it to be a translucent surface so that when you go into the booth, booth to give your confessional, you feel as though you have s some barrier, some uh, disconnect that happens so that you can talk freely about what's happening uh, in the school. There you see the voided corner detail and the sort of hairy, hairy and graphic surface on that. And so finally, um, we're working on a project now that just started construction called the Hillside Rock. And we think of this as a Scott Cohen, Los, Johnston Markley, McKay Lyons, Venturi Scott Brown orgy on a secluded wooden site in Northwest Arkansas. And uh, we really have t sort of wanted to embody some of the forms that we were inspired by uh, from these architects. And the house itself sits on a bluff um, that is looking south over the Boston Mountains. And so it takes advantage of this wooded site that is also looking over the Boston Mountains. And you can see here how some of those formal influence that we were talking about kind of kiss as they turn the corners of the elevations of this building. And the house itself, uh, I think, serendipitously became this abstracted rock outcropping within the site. And I, I, think, I like to think that it's a uh, sort of counterpoint to the color in the site, beautiful uh, post oak trees in the site, another uh, wonderful color. And so the white becomes this abstract, abstract counterpoint to the site itself. That's the south side that you're looking at. So we've inset porches on the south side. Uh, we love the porch, it seems, in, in, in our architecture. And we've inset these porches to shade against the, uh, the harsh southern sun. But you also get to sit on these porches and look out over the wonderful uh, Boston mountains. And this gives you an indication in the rear there of where you'd be in the kitchen space in the eating area against the woods. And so this house becomes a sort of split personality where on one half of the house, you're in the woods. On the other half of the house, you are in the Boston mountains. So the, the last two projects that we're going to show you are, I would say, the inverse of the previous group, where we have sort of multiple influences coming together. I think that, that a lot of our work has been about how do you sort of look at singular problems and couple them with multiple sensibilities? So you have really clear, distinct figures that are revealed in time through basically protracted or extended experiences. So we think of that in, in really in terms of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, one person, radically different personalities. Um, and so the first project we're gonna show you is a, is a, was a four week design build competition that we did for the Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis called the Super sukkah. I think a lot of places have these competitions for these temporary sukkah pavilions. Um, this one asked us to look at um, absence and presence, which really scratched us where we itch. Um, so what we immediately thought of was a lot of the events surrounding the, the festivals sort of take, take place in the evening. So we would reverse the typical architectural paradigm of presence during the day um, and really look at perhaps how the, how the thing would be absent during the day and then present at night. Um, again, looking at really two cliches in architecture of, of reflection and illumination and um, seeing how the illumination could actually happen from energy captured um, during that day um, as well. So the shape that we developed was in response to uh, wanting the exterior to reflect as many different aspects of the environment, the existing buildings, the sky, um, the ground, and also to have as many different orientations on the interior volume to be able to project that light um, at night. And so um, this is the day pavilion, or like the day view of the pavilion. Um, this was. 1500 bucks in, in, in four weeks, and it was a really Herculean effort um, for us. Imagine driving down the highway with metal sticking out of the back of a truck, wondering if it's gonna get under highway overpasses, that sort of thing. Yeah, it was a grassroots effort, let's say. Um, and so on the, the interior during the day became really interesting as well in, in terms of how it cut up the environment um, in different ways that we thought were pretty interesting. And we developed the volumes and in in, they were connected at corners, so it really felt like a very tenuous kind of structure all made out of one-inch steel tube. And then this is the night view. 
So we were, th this was really the first time that we started looking at the idea that um, materials outside of architecture could be used as volume, and we really liked this idea of illumination, and we were working on this project actually concurrently with our other, other experiment into this, which is the, the Mood Ring House. Um, and this, this project um, really began to, I would say, take this idea of that a project could have two radically distinct different architectures that were revealed between day and night. Um, and so the influences, I think, are very, are very clear in this work. Um, so the house is a live work house. It's built on a, on a, on a fairly tricky site that was mostly floodplain. Um, it's a, it's a significantly sloped site, um, which was great because by lifting the living spaces off of the ground, we were able to um, basically create a tree house to create a really private um, enclave. And the, by minimizing the base as well, um, it allowed us to save a lot on the foundation costs, which are really expensive in Arkansas. Um, so you can see how we thought about the overall shape during the day, which would be the top diagram, and then perhaps what, how we could begin to read the, the night massing and volume. So it's really a reversal of the figure ground as you go from day, day to night. Um, and these are the plans. The, the house is oriented in an odd way on the site, basically to front the real uh, intersection and the real front um, as you approach the site. It also slides around two existing monumental trees that are there um, and we, that we wanted to preserve. And in doing so, actually orients the house much more to a true north-south, um, east-west orientation. So the, the, the lower level is workspace, an office, utility space, and a single car garage. And the top is basically a, a big loft and a couple of bedrooms. Uh, it's a pretty modest house. Um, we designed it in a way that uh, economically on a four foot module to really minimize the cost. We did this house for $80 a square foot, uh, about $150,000. So we, and we also built this one ourselves. So uh, we were really looking at ways to economize at every different, every different level. The exterior cladding is pre-finished hardy plank, or hardy panel, excuse me, and the, uh, the trims are galvanized roof flash that we, uh, if you've ever used hardy panel, you know that the metal trims are more expensive than the actual panel. Uh, so we found a way to sort of economize that in our detailing. Uh, this is the backyard view with our, our shack that's uh, on the property, which is really great actually in kind of framing that space. Uh, but you can see how it sort of sits on the site and is, and is perched up in the trees. Um, on the north side, this is the view from the north side, so you can see both the front and the back overhang, the back porch and the front porch. Um, in Ohio, you sort of live and enter your house through the porches, and so it was really important to us to sort of bring that, bring that reference, I think, in, into this project. But the entry is actually on the side um, in that relationship, and uh, this is what happens from day to night. So during the day, it's very demure, actually. It sits back off the street, so d despite the, the macho form, it actually is a, a house that people often drive by without noticing. And then at night, that changes. Um, so you can see that the, the figuration in the house really begins to disappear. This is more of a dusk view. Um, and the, the longer you sort of look at this image, the more the, the light really begins to construct the volumes of space outside. Um, which is a really interesting idea for us because I think that illumination in architecture is typically relied on the surface as a surface effect, and this is really more of a spatial proposition. The neighborhood, by the way, has embraced this where we're starting to see LED colored lights popping up. All, we, we wondered if the neighbors would hate this, but they've actually embraced it. Yeah, we think we've created a rainbow light district in yeah. Fayetteville. And so on the interior, it's a very different kind of quality, particularly during the day, because the house is flooded with natural light. And, and we created this section in a uh, uh, perhaps not so inventive way, but we took a, a regular gabled roof truss and just flipped it upside down to create the alto-like section that allows the north light to uh, come into the space. And this is a, a crack that we call it that is where you enter into that goes all along the north side of the house. And it begins to open up the space in a way that connects it from front to back all the way through on the interior. 
And this is the main living space. It's, it, again, it really starts to feel like a loft when you're in there, um, very open, and the spaces begin to overlap and, and interlock in really um, subtle ways. Um, and so you can see that the, um, the house really is, I think, a, a strong direction in the way that we're starting to see our work. And um, we definitely want to build more of our own projects. And we're also, we're very interested in the way that architecture change presence, changes presence, and it's very vivid and more persistently vivid as a way to engage broader audiences for the work. Basically, the more diverse appearances that a work has, the more possibility it is to engage broader constituencies. And so, really expanding the audiences for architecture is a very important idea for us. And we think we do that best by creating compelling aesthetic things. And um, yeah, so we'll, we'll end with this slide. Actually, we're doing great on time. Yeah, we can do, let's get another presentation up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is a figure that we, uh, kind of aspirational figure for us. You guys probably don't know this architect. Um, his name is uh, Sambo Johnson. Um, he's actually a, a hybrid image of Philip Johnson and Sam Mockby. And we think that this figure is uh, sort of actually more, those two architects are more alike than what, than what you all think. And um, yeah, that's where we're like at. I how he ended with y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you.